Hi, I'm Matt Schwartz. I'm a producer, songwriter, engineer, mixer, programmer, and I play a few instruments. I do from pop music to dance music, uh, a bit of trip hop, uh, a little bit of indie. Um, it, it depends. I've done I've done kind of quite extreme range of, of different genres. I played violin for seven years, but don't ask me to play it again. I wish I wish I continued. When I was um, a teenager, about 14, I, I realised violin is, is not really going to help me with girls. So I moved to bass guitar and that did the trick. Um, so then I went with some friends to a recording studio and the first time I, I kind of saw a proper recording studio, I was like, oh my God, I was mesmerised. And what I wanted to do right then and then is become a sound engineer. All the lights, all the you know knobs and compressors, and, and I, I didn't know what, what things were at the time. Um, but I fell in love like on the spot, um, and that kind of I guess shaped my future life. I studied in Kingston University. There, there was a school called Gateway uh, School of um, Engineering. But before that, actually, before that, I was I was kind of running a rehearsal room. I was you know helping bands and, and doing bits. I'd love to work with Michael Jackson. From Beyonce to, um, to Metallica and Coldplay would be nice. I wish Nirvana was still around, but Foo Fighters will do. Yeah. I've done an artist, I think, um, my favourite as of late is a girl called Kate Stewart on, on, on Warner. Um, she's fantastic. Um, singer, songwriter, and um, a, band, a band called All Twins. What a fantastic band from Dublin. Amazing musicians. Um, down to earth, but just so creative. It's an absolute pleasure every time we kind of make a record together. I've done some records with you know, a girl called Sela Sue who I absolutely adore. Uh, she's a Belgium artist, actually. She's not uh, British. Um, she's absolutely fantastic. I think we're, we are going to make it another record on the next album, because the label paint for future production. So I'm like, yeah, I'll take it. I love orchestras. Um, record labels, however, you know, they like sampled orchestras. Although I've been quite lucky in the last few records that, uh, you know, people have given me the budgets for orchestras, but we had to go all the way to Budapest because um, the, the, the London Philharmonic could be too expensive. I'm just about to sign an, an, an artist, but I can't say much about it until, until I've done this. But she's, she's amazing, she's 16, uh, absolutely wonderful. And I'm probably going to put a few more records out as an artist myself. I know I'm getting on, but it still seems to be working. I've got. Um, I've got a few, I kind of found a, an interesting, interesting sound. Uh, it seems to be working in a kind of formula that I can keep kind of making them one after the other. Still got some life in me as far as being an artist. By formula, I mean arrangements and certain sonics um, of how you put a record together um, without kind of uh, in the past, you know, when I was an artist, I had a certain formula that kind of worked over quite a few years. Um, and then it changed. And then it took me another couple of years and, and, and I found another formula. Um, I, I love, you know, any new style that comes in. Um, I love learning it. I love understanding it. Uh, as soon as something comes in that I don't like, I force myself to study it and to learn it. I make a nice salad, but every engineer should make a nice salad, especially mixing engineers. If you can't make a nice salad, then you are not worthy of being a mixing engineer. Perhaps in the old days, if you used to be a vinyl, or even a CD, you had something physical, you had something to read, you had something to, con to connect to. Um, whether today, you know, if you go on Spotify, you just pass, you know, tune by tune by tune by tune. There's no, there's no attachment, there's no, you don't connect with artists as much, you, you don't do stuff like that. Which is quite important. It's always been quite important for music to kind of for people kinda, to represent their songs. Now, just songs that, that people put out, and there's no there's no longevity. You know, songs that come out today, 
you will not hear in three months time. It is certainly a change and the industry is gonna try to adapt, but no one quite has the answer of what to do next. We don't know what's gonna happen next year. May get much better, may not. Um, but we, you know, especially songwriters, are being hammered at the moment from every direction. For example, the United States passed laws that are very, very bad for songwriters. Um, that will come into effect within the next 12 months. Uh, a lot of the publishers and collection societies are trying to fight it, but, you know, the American government is a very powerful body. Songwriters are not going to be able to, uh, are not going to be allowed to remove their content from YouTube and from Spotify. If you've got any writer, if you've got like five writers on the song, any, write, any of those writers can, put, can upload the stuff on YouTube and Spotify, even if the other writers um, don't want to. It started off as, you know, the, the collection started in the, in the States, kind of, um, and c companies were, were trying to kind of do a good thing uh, as far as this, but the government completely turned it on its head. Uh, I think if you're online, you get a lot of information. People can make records with headphones and a laptop. And that's fine, you know. I personally, I, you know, I, I, I'm not like that. I've tried, but I'm not, you know, it's impossible for me. I like to listen, I like to turn things up, and I like to feel it in my stomach. I, you know, headphones, you know, you can feel it in your head. I like to feel it in, in my body. I like speakers to kind of, to work. The most important thing is your room. You always need to invest enough to acoustically treat your room the best way possible. Uh, now, acoustics is not an exact science, unfortunately. Uh, no matter what people tell you. If people tell you, yeah, I can make your room sound amazing, I'll just build it, uh, that's, uh, it's never gonna work. Because after you build a room, you have to fix it and fix it and fix it and fix it. It, takes, it can take a long time to kind of get it right. Um, but obviously, you, you don't need to spend a lot of money at the beginning, you just do some corner, some bass traps and some, you know, some wedges and, and, and bits to kind of help your sound. Um, in the room, um, and then obviously, then you need to get a decent pair of speakers and an amazing converter. You have to be able to get an amazing converter because that's the sound that's coming out of your computer. And again, it goes back to the cleaner the sound is that's coming out of your computer into your speakers, the less you're going to have to work, the less you're going to have to EQ, the less you're going to have to compress, um, the less you're going to have to destroy whatever is there that doesn't need to be destroyed. And of course, you know, today you can destroy a lot of things, but, you know, as, as most people know, you can, you can have a plug-in, um, an instrument plug-in that you play a few sounds, and it just sounds amazing to start with. So why, why mess with things if they sound good to begin with? Um, and it's okay to program, you know, I love programming sounds. Um, and that's an art that's kind of slowly disappearing. You know, people just rely on presets. Um, and that's slightly unhealthy. You know, you, I think it's very important when, when you first start to learn how to program a synth. If you are a programmer, you know, if you're not just an engineer, if you're a creator, uh, it's really important to, to do that because in, then you make your own sounds. If you just rely on other people to make the sounds, it, things are never going to move forward. I've done an album on, on Dave Gilmore's boat. Uh, I think Dave Gilmore from Pink Floyd. Uh, he's, he's got a lovely studio on the Thames. Um, called Astoria, and I think they had the rack of, of prisons back then. As soon as I kind of put it through my chain, it felt like something was unveiled from the speakers, but I couldn't believe it. The, the sonics of it were, were incredible. Um, it changed the way I worked, you know, after I got my first prison, it completely changed the way I worked. Um, I never thought how, how important um, the conversion um, is really, and not only for recording, um, but for your monitoring. Um, most people don't realize that, you know, you can, you can have the best monitors in the world, you can have everything, you know, incredible. But if you cut corners on the converter, that defeats the object of basically having a clean, clean listening environment. In the studio, you want kind of the truest sound that you can get. It's fine if your speakers are a little bit colored or if there's a little bit issues, but the signal that goes into the speakers needs to be the cleanest signal possible. Um, and Prism did that for me. It completely changed everything. You know, my mixes became better, my productions became better. Um, 
and everything became slightly quicker because if you have a clean sound, if, if everything is clear, you realize that you need to do less and less. Um, the more muddy your, your speakers and your monitor path is, the more likely you have to EQ and compress and do stuff that, to sounds that you don't really need to do because it already sounds good. Most sounds actually sound good to begin with. Um, and that was, that was something that, you know, when I was younger, I didn't understand so much. Um, I had to EQ everything, I had to compress everything. And it's fine, I think it's important when you first start to do that because you just understand the nature of how things work. Kick drums, hi-hats, um, loops, they sound amazing already. Um, samples these days are really, really high quality. Um, and w with the right converter, the right monitors, if you go, you won't need to touch anything. If you lift it up and it sounds amazing, um, half the job is done. Generally these days when I mix, um, and w when I work on records, I don't tend to spend a lot of time on one instrument or, or one sound. Um, I, I, I kind of, I do get a feeling from the whole track. It doesn't mean that people should do that from the beginning. At the beginning, it is important that you mess around with an EQ, with a compressor, just to understand you know, the nature of things. Uh, it's fine to mess for a whole week on a kick drum. It's fine. You know, you, people don't need to be scared of that. It's important. It's a part of learning. Eventually, when you get to a situation when you don't, you know, you, you, you don't solo a kick, you just do the tracks and, and put it all together, and, and it's only, it, it, it projects a certain feeling that hits you in the right place, and you know the record is mixed, and the record is right without going like, oh my God, that kick is amazing, and that snare is amazing. The whole record is amazing. And the secret to any record is the feeling. It's what, whatever it's projecting out of the speakers. It's not about the best kick in the world. It's not about the best bass in the world. It's about the best feeling that come about, comes out of your speakers from the whole record. That's it. That, for me, that's... The key, the, the key to making any record. Some of them may not sound sonically maybe as perfect as they should, um, but it, you know, if it hits in the right place, then it hits in the right place. And that's the beauty of music. At the end of the day, we are all emotion traders. You know, we're selling a moment, you know, we create a moment and then hopefully that moment will affect lots of other people and, and they're going to connect with the record. Or, you know, you, you, you can also say, you know, I don't really care what other people think. That makes me feel good and that's it. And that's okay as well. It's important. You can stay true to what you believe in. Um, even, if, even if it means, you know, eating a slice of bread a day. My 1964 and the strat my business manager gave me. Um, she's lovely. I love her, of course. Uh, it's a special guitar. It was a late husband's and she had a dream about the guitar uh, one day and then she, she said, Matt, you know, can you help me sell it? And then I felt like it's, at the time it was like, <laughs> I went on eBay and it was like 27 and a half thousand pounds. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that's really, uh, and I tried to kind of help her to sell it, and um, eventually, anyway, um, she decided to give it to me. The second thing now that's slightly a bigger problem. Maybe my acoustic guitar. I'm just thinking if I'm on <laughs> if I'm on a desert island, you know, I need something to do. You know, there's no electricity. I know, I know this one is electric, the Strat, but you know, it's, it feels nice and special. Um, Probably a laptop. If if I could if I could have electricity, I'd probably take a laptop with me, and um, yeah. But then I'll need my prism and my speakers. You see, you see what you've started. I can sleep on the electric guitar. It can be, you know, it can cover me when it's cold. Is it, you know? What else can you do with the guitar? I don't want to think. Um, yeah, it's a, it's just a special thing. You know, you can talk to it and it answers back. I think I've been in the studio for too long. The more records you make, the better you get at it. I mean, obviously if you make like a thousand records and you're still the same as you were, the first record, there may be a problem with that, you know, with that talent bit. Um, but generally, working hard brings out um, 
your talent, you know, fail, make mistakes, and mix really shitty records with really shitty mixes. Um, that's how you learn. If you don't know what crap is, how are you going to know what good is? You know, it's as simple as that. Just say yes to everything. Don't worry about getting ripped off, although you will get ripped off. That's the nature of our business. It's, it's a bit sad, but that's what happens, you know. That's the price that you have to pay. Uh, that's your university. The thing that stops most young people that come into the business is fear. You know, fear of, of being abused, of, again, being ripped off. Don't be scared. I was fortunate enough that, that it kind of happened to me the first three years that I kind of entered the business, but it can take, you know, up to 15 years, 10, 15 years. In your mind, you need to think you're going to be starving for the next 10, 15 years before things happen. Uh, but you're going to learn a craft. You're going to have a craft that is um, going to help you for the rest of your life. I've learned that someone can be in the room with you. They don't have to do anything, but just their sheer presence makes you do things in a different way.